Welcome to Discovery Indie Film. I'm your host, Jeff Howard, and I have got filmmaker Fadi Haddad with me. Hey, Fadi. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for being here. So I know Fadi because he brought his feature film Lupe to the festival I, I program, Film Invasion Los Angeles, in 2020, which means Fadi submitted Lupe before COVID existed because our final deadline was like March 15th. So maybe if someone submitted that last week, they had a clue. I actually didn't look up what day you submitted, but that was the festival that everything changed. So we didn't get to meet at the theater. We didn't get to hang out in person, but we got to Zoom back then. And we're getting to Zoom again now. So again, if the audio isn't perfect, don't blame Fadi or me. Just blame blame whatever corporation owns Zoom. <laughs> But we are here to uh, discuss his career and, and how he got to where he is. And uh, and then we'll talk about Lupe. And before we jump into that, people who listen to this podcast might know I always mention that Discovery Indie Film has a companion TV series on Amazon Prime Video. So I'll just mention, if you want to be a wonderful, kind person, go to Amazon Prime Video, search for Discovery Indie Film, and enjoy some really wonderful short films that are handpicked from the festival circuit. Um, so I have now mentioned that and give that five stars, give the podcast five stars. And now I'm just going to turn over to Fadi and say, all right, sir. Uh, I love Lupe. I love the feature film you made and and sent over to us last year. Yeah, it was last year. And, uh, what inspired you to become a filmmaker? Thanks. uh, Thanks, Jeff, for those kind words. Um, I never, um, you know, it's interesting. I I don't have the story. Like when I went to film school and all these kids had these stories of like when I came out the womb and they gave me a VHS recorder and I was like, and I don't really have that story. You know what I mean? I grew up in a neighborhood in Chicago that they didn't have much. And and I grew up playing basketball and football and, and, and I never really considered myself to be in the creative field at all. When I was in high school, I went to a, one of the biggest schools in Illinois, and they it's a technical prep school, basically. So you had to kind of choose a trade. And it was like auto shop or uh, uh, t- it's like now it's all technical computer coding and all that stuff. But that wasn't around back then, obviously. Not that I'm that old. But um, it was like people usually went to auto works or wood shop or, or that. You had to really choose something. And they had something called the radio TV. And I chose radio TV simply because I actually thought I made a good kind of radio personality and I could, I knew hip hop and I, I play music and I knew politics and music and movies and I was kind of into pop culture. So I just took it because I thought it was going to be like a radio DJ, if you will. And then it turned out to be more TV broadcast than anything radio related. So I started doing like the, the school news and the school productions and senior videos and prom stuff and stuff like that. And I, I really fell in love with just, um, really recording and editing and trying to create things. And then from there I went to Columbia and then I, I realized what I was in and that was, uh, I was going to be a writer director. And, and I, I traced it back when I was making videos in fourth grade, fifth grade. And I realized that I, for school projects, I wouldn't write a paper, I'd do a video. And so I kind of painted it in my mind that I was kind of always kind of meant to do this, but that's how I kind of roughly fell into it, if you will. That's a really cool story that, you know, I know so many, actually my major in college was mass media with like, it was like mass media colon radio TV film. Yeah. And I love the idea that you were about radio at first. <laughs> Cause I loved radio as a kid. I think I yeah. was, uh, I thought radio was, was awesome. And, and yeah, if you were into hip hop and stuff, obviously that stuff couldn't get on TV depending on when you grew up. It was, it was pretty rare. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, uh, I really just wanted to be on a local radio station playing, hip hop songs and, and listening to callers and talking BS and, and just have a good time. And I, I'd be the 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. and I'd go home and chill. So that's what I originally wanted, but it wasn't but really it, what really But wanted. in high school, when you were still in high school at, at that at that school, you you got – did you just learn everything about production, like everything, editing, stuff on set, lighting? Was it just pretty complete? Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty much uh, – that we got our hands on cameras, Final Cut Pro editing software. Um, we would do like live broadcasts. We would do the school news on that broadcast. And we, we I had to, learn, we would also do like our events, like our, um, we had international nights or like the talent show. And we had an uh, uh, audience in an auditorium and we did put on shows. And I would ha- basically be live, kind of almost TDN, you know what I mean? Like a live show. And, 
put it to tape and we would sell DVDs for the school and stuff like that. So yeah, I got a pretty good kind of gorilla course and, and how things worked on, on, a, on a, a, yeah. a small scale. Yeah. And it sounds very TV in a way, like almost like a small TV station you yeah. guys are running. Yeah. Um, and then I think you, you dropped a little hint that you went to Columbia. Yeah. I in New York Columbia city. College. Uh, yeah. Amazing. No, not in New oh, York. It, Columbia there, college. There's a Columbia college. See, this is what's interesting about this is I always get this question because we don't know what to say because we went to there's a school in Columbia in Chicago called Columbia College. It's like a top five. I I think it's a top five film school in the country. I could be totally off there. At least that's what they marketed it as, right? And I grew up ten minutes away from downtown Chicago, so this is in the heart of the city. You know what I mean? But it's called Columbia College, Chicago, basically. And so we don't know what to say when we say Columbia. We always get the oh, you went to you went to New- you left Chicago, you went to New York, and I'm like no, 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 no. So I tend to say Columbia Film School in Chicago, but yeah, it's like it's a good program, great program, a lot of good teachers, a lot of good um, mentors, and they have like. 20, 25 buildings, downtown Chicago, all dedicated to certain things. There's a film building, an animation building, a post building, a music building. So uh, it's a pretty big program. Right. So you applied there because you were interested in that field at that point. Yeah. I, I figured it was the next step. Yeah. Yeah. And did you find, did, were you drawn to directing? Or were you drawn to being to that role? Or when did that start? So here's the thing. I, I didn't know what any of the, I didn't know how films were made to, till my orientation at Columbia, believe it or not. I sat down in the auditorium and they were breaking down roughly what four years at Columbia looked like. I actually never knew. I grew up watching movies and I love movies and love TV, but I, I never knew how it was made. And I, I was at a disadvantage because of where I grew up in the sense that. I didn't have access to these things. My parents are immigrants from Jordan. We they didn't take us to movies on Fridays. Like all these, all these uh, college kids, all their stories were like, "Oh, my father took me to the cinema every week." And there's nothing wrong with it. God bless it. You know what I mean? I just didn't have that. And so when I got to Columbia orientation, they were saying, you know, pre-production, production, post-production, and I was really like, I had ideas that I wanted to write and direct. So I kind of knew that, okay, I don't want to be a camera operator. I don't want to be a TP. I'm not interested in that. I could edit, but it's not really, I really want to do. I really want to write and tell stories. So that's why I kind of leaned into the writer director aspect of it. And had you been, had you written stuff for fun as a kid? Like, did you write stories? No. Like it's skits, right? Like you're doing stuff with your friends, you're doing stuff with your brother and the, you know, you're coming up with like, I, I grew up on WWF and you, you're writing storylines for people, but it's never like pen to paper. It's not, I don't even know that that's a thing. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's a weird dynamic because I always identify it as it, but I never understood what it really was. If that makes sense. For sure. Yeah. So you really didn't start, start typing away until college. Yeah, for sure. Right. Writing. So, but at that point you're writing scripts and you're, and I assume it's the kind of, uh, collegiate film school program where you're you're other people's crew and you're other people's this and then other people work for you and, and you get a feel for everything yeah exactly we took production one production two production three <clears throat> what's interesting is i'm part of the generation i know it's going to sound weird to you but i'm part of the generation that i'm the last generation to know what it's like without technology i think and then we were the first ones to have it so my first year at columbia they made us shoot on something called a Bolex. I don't know if you know, oh, 60 I know millimeter a Bolex. hand crank and you got a, uh, you could only shoot for a minute. It's without sound and it's black and white. And so we, I have, and then did they make training. you edit? They make you splice it and like you use a flatbed. That's where the word splice comes from is they, they made yeah. you cut it, tape it together. And in the, in the, I forgot what it's called, but it's in the thing. And so and they would make it. That was our first year and a half at Columbia. Halfway in, you could tell it was changing, and they started going to those mini DV tapes and those kind of Sony handheld cameras. Um, but I always appreciated doing that because, you know, I used to be like, man, I, I already know Final Cut. Why am I sitting here cutting film with a razor blade in a dark room? And but it makes you understand, first of all, how to edit in camera because you don't have that much to waste, right? It also teaches you of the business a little bit of why they call it the cutting room floor, why they, you know what I mean? It just gives you some sort of that nostalgia and that history of, of, of it. So it, it, I appreciate it to this day. For sure. Yeah. So Final Cut Pro and stuff existed, but the For school sure. was just into the discipline 
of, uh, of working with physical film? Well, at that point, digital hadn't taken over. Digital was like for the BMXers and the skaters and then all that stuff. People remember like Spielberg was still making Munich and he was cutting it, you know what I mean? And uh, on the, on the physically. So the industry hadn't necessarily transitioned, but by my senior year, it had fully transitioned. So it was just, I was part of that generation where just, I saw the, the transition live. So when I was a senior, freshmen coming in weren't doing that because the curriculum had changed so much. You know what right. I mean? Right. So, so you were so, right there. So you were like the last group yeah. that got to play with those Bolexes. Yeah, for sure. At least, at least forcibly. If you wanted to play with them voluntarily, you might go ahead, but they made us do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people, you know, we still get, a film or two every year that someone shot on 16 just because they wanted the aesthetic, even yeah. though you can kind of mimic it now digitally. Well, it's, I think not, I don't know. I'm not a purist in the sense of, I know how hard it is to shoot films and the fact that I can't look at what I'm looking at and I can't see it, even when I put a LUD on it or whatever, what have you, you know what I mean? Like the fact that I can't look at what I'm shooting, I think is the biggest disadvantage of stuff like that. For sure. No, I mean, I'm a bit older than you. I'm not, not going to ask the exact year you were born, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I can remember back when, I mean, the most expensive part of making an independent film used to be the lab, the film lab. Yeah. That was the biggest chunk that came out of your pocket. If you were making a short or making a feature, I mean, you shot on this film and you tried, yeah, used to limit your, your shooting ratio because you knew that you were going to have to pay out here. It was Photocam. You're going to have to pay them thousands of dollars to like give you your, 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 what was it? The dailies and, you know, that first print. Yeah. And we, we, I got that experience and I really appreciated it. I, my first class we shot. I shot something in the park and it was underexposed and I'm just like, Oh, okay. I understand. Like, like that's where the light meters come in and that's where making sure you're properly, all that stuff comes in and now it's all fixable in post. But I think me having a a bit of uh, um, experience with that, I think makes me a little bit better. I think, but who knows, right? Who knows? No, I mean, you know, I know everyone, everyone shits on the new generation that like, Oh, they're not suffering like we did, but what are you going to do? Right. I mean, yeah. It's I don't cool. blame him, man. Hell, there's a brand new iPhone that can do unbelievable tracking shots and, and deep yeah. focus moves. I mean, they just keep making it, you know, we'll see. And uh, so when did you get to make your first film? Like like something that, like a short that you you were the writer director of? Was that like second, third year? Or? Um, Are you saying for homework or kind of outside of a club? Either one. Either one. Or yeah, well, we, like well, when it was homework, did it not feel like yours? <laughs> No, it did. It did. I guess, uh, um, we, but we were, we were, that was the training, right? We shot, I took production one, production two, production three. You had to shoot a short each time. By the time it got to production three, we were digital at that point. So it was a little bit uh, different. Um, but we're talking two minutes, five minutes, seven minutes. So it wasn't too, um, too intense. My senior year, I was making a film outside of it, outside of Columbia. It was a 15 minute short that we shot. And I actually premiered it at Columbia's theater on my own. Like I rented it out and had an event and, and brought people out my senior year. So by the end of it, I was doing stuff on my own. But um, yeah, we had certain projects that we shot. And then we Columbia has a practice. They actually had something called Semester in L.A. where they take 15 students and they put them in, in, a, in a company out in L.A. and they give them real world experience and stuff like that. So, yeah, I was on a bunch of sets. Of, of, I was first AD in a lot, second AD in a lot. So um, they put us to work. I, I really appreciate Columbia uh, for, for, for giving us that experience. That sounds pretty ambitious to me, making your own film while you're going to school. Like, I bet everyone well, When you see it. it, you might not think it's particularly <laughs> ambitious. <laughs> but no, it wasn't... It, remember, we were all kids who... We were shooting stuff the whole time, basically. I, I, I grew up... I had classes with people who had a hundred thousand YouTube subscribers who were doing skits and they ended up leaving school because it was like, we're, we've been doing this this whole time already. So um, once the digital age kind of came in, it was, it was a lot easier to kind of shoot stuff on your own, believe it or not. And then I, I, I wanted to do it senior year because 
I had access to Columbia's kind of uh, production house. So I could rent lights and rent cameras and rent gear from them as a student. So that's why I kind of wanted to do that before I left. Right. You were, you were making the most of, of, yeah, for sure. of the uh, opportunity. Yeah. 100%. All right. All right. So what happens when you graduate? What, what, what do you do next? I graduate. I premiere my film that summer and then I, I really enjoy that process. So I grew up not knowing how a Chicago kid who wanted to stay in Chicago was going to break into an industry that was in LA. Now I know that with, with the technology and all the shows that are here in Atlanta and Toronto and, and all the, like, I don't necessarily have to go to LA per se, but I was worried about how I would do that. This was uh, close to 10 years ago at this point. Right. So um, I made my film, liked it. And then I thought, what if I just become kind of like, Kevin Smith, right, where he kind of makes his own movie with his own people, his own thing, premieres it his own way. I could take it to Ohio and rent a theater and premiere it there, and I could I could kind of do that kind of um, tour style, if you will. And I'm just a one guy with one film going to one place and, and showing it out. And, and it really worked for me for that first time. And then – so that was 2000 – I don't remember. But that was my first year after Columbia, and then – Two years after that, I made a second one. This one was close to 30 minutes. Um, and I shot, did the same thing, right? Rented a thousand seat theater, probably put 250 people in the seats, which I'll, I'll take as a W for sure. And then, um, that was my second. And then Lupe ended up being my third one. There was a little bit of a gap there where I started doing music videos, uh, kind of testimonial videos, kind of company videos. And I was doing that stuff. And then Lupe was ended up being my third film uh, six years after my second film. So there's a little bit of a gap there. A little bit of a gap, but you were doing, yeah, the music videos. I bet there's a lot of industrial film work in Chicago. Yeah, well, thousand percent. Yeah, there's a lot of, of, especially when the hip hop boom came in that early 2012, 13, where it was just like everybody was a rapper and everybody was going to pay 500 bucks to stand there and, and kind of rap with their friends on the, on the stairs, right? So I, I made some money trying to do that stuff. It wasn't particularly probably great stuff, but uh, I was honing my craft and I was trying to make a couple of dollars along the way. And were you itching to, uh, like, was Lupe something you you were writing and getting ready to do or? Um, I didn't know what my next film would be because I I was, I wanted to, you know, I wanted each one to be better than the last one. And I didn't want to just shoot to shoot it. You know what I mean? I wanted to each one to be a step. My second film was 10 times better than my first one. If you were to watch them, you would probably think the same thing. Lupe is 10 times better than my second one. So I, I, I really wanted to push the envelope as much as I could. I also just didn't have the money and I didn't have resources. And it, it took me a little bit of, of time to, okay, I, I know somebody with a red and I know somebody who could color this. And I, I built on my network along the way too. So I think it was just, it was on time for, for everything that like, I could have never made that movie outside. Plus it took two years to make in the sense of we shot it in Chicago. You only had a limited time before it just gets too cold. Right. So November to April, you can't really shoot. So I shot originally in October, the weekend after I shoot, it's snowing. So I had to wait a whole year to shoot the following October because May in Chicago doesn't look like October in Chicago. It looks completely different. Like fall in Chicago has a certain look and aesthetic. So I really, I shot this in four days, two days in October, a year later, another two days in October. So yeah, it, it might've came out six years after, but it was, it was in the process a little bit during. And it's an amazing story. I remember this from uh, the Q and a for film invasion in 2020, yeah. the, the year apart, because it doesn't show, doesn't show yeah. one bit when you watch it. It's it, that stuff seamless. The fact that you were able to keep the cast and crew together. Yeah. Remarkable, just remarkable, the continuity of it. Um, I forget, did you do a lot of rewriting in between? Like, well, uh, I add, No, I, I added a scene because um, the actor that I got, I just particularly just wanted to give him more material to kind of shoot in. And we were able to fill some some story. It's it's beneficial, right, when you can get half the film, edit it, and see kind of where, you're, where, where, you're, where your hole's at, and then be like, okay, I could, I could kind of patch this a little bit. And we shot the back half of the movie first. So I was able to kind of patch some of the story holes in the beginning when we came back the next year. And it, it's kind of difficult, right? I was telling people, try not to gain too much weight, try not to lose weight. 
uh, keep the same clothes, just put them in a Ziploc and put them in your closet. Um, I don't know if you can notice it. Someone's wearing a different pair of glasses than they were the year before. And that was just uncontrollable. You know, <laughs> at some point someone had moved to Florida during and was, um, I'll just say it had, a. uh, uh a, a, a trouble with legally with, with the police. And I, it was like, I had to fly him out and, and get him back to Chicago for the weekend legally. And I had to write like his probation officer and do that stuff and, and get it. So we weren't in trouble. And we were, cause I'll tell you what, six dudes in a car in Chicago with like fake guns and fake bullets. And <laughs> it was a disaster. If something would have, we got lucky and, and nothing happened, but if cops pulled us over, it was going to be a disaster. For sure. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, wait, so, um, I guess I, I didn't quite ask the question, like the yeah. Lupe, the Lupe screenwriting process. Mm-hmm. Um, where, what was the inspiration? So for anybody who doesn't know, Lupe is about basically a missing girl who, uh, three neighborhood friends kind of team up and try to figure out what happened in this kind of dark underworld, if you will. Jeff, you could correct me if that's kind of an accurate, uh, log line or not. I think, I think you know your film, but, but I'll <laughs> add, I'll add, you know, it, well, I shouldn't add this yet, but my God, I mean, I think about how um, I think the word is prescient. The story is Mm -hmm. that we, that since I've seen your film, I guess it's actually, I mean, it's been a big deal for many years that uh, a pretty white girl goes missing in Aruba and it's a national news. And these guys know that the cops, no one cares about a girl from their neighborhood missing. Yeah. Yeah. That's almost the inspiration behind it. It was, you know, when you're scrolling on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and you see this girl's missing and this girl's missing and this girl's missing, I was profoundly affected by we never get a follow up. Like rarely is there even a body found or rarely is there like, oh, this girl was found perfectly. She just whatever happened and she was gone for two days. Right. There's never usually a follow up, even if there is in real life, it's never on the timeline. Right. It's always like the missing person's report. And that's kind of what sparked it is like, okay, what if the girl's missing? And then I kind of ran with, this is what happened in this kind of night that she was missing. And, and this, that's kind of the motivation behind it. I really wrote it, believe it or not, in, in a single sitting only because the way I work is very much, I know the story and I let it marinate in my mind and kind of like, you know, it's always like that when you hear about Jay Z's writing process, where he just kind of like thinks and thinks and thinks, and then he'll just have it. It seems magical and it seems whimsical, but he's really doing all the work in his mind. And that's what I kind of like to do. I'll try to get the beginning, I try to get the end second, and then I'll fill in the gaps here and there. So when I sit, I kind of already have it, and I kind of already know what's what. If that makes sense. I mean, it makes perfect sense. It also reminds me you have a young, agile mind because you can think of thoughts. And then you actually remember all the pieces so you can put them together in your storyline. Because uh, I can remember being able to, to sort of think that way. And I have to be honest, like at this point, like I need notes. <laughs> no, I, I, need I, notes. I, say, I need notes to introduce someone on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's not necessarily the most efficient thing to do. But remember, this is this is 60 minutes. It's not like... It's not a 210 kind of page script, right? So, and, and remember, a lot of a majority of it takes place in a car. So, did I know every piece of dialogue, or did I know every piece of kind of beat, or if you will, or tone change? No, definitely not. Like that stuff will happen in the writing process for sure. And I, even though I'm, I write it in a setting, I'll go back and adjust it uh, along. Right. The way. So you did. You did refine it over over a long for sure. One hundred percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. I'll then, never be like. I'll never be like try to take credit for being a savant and trying to get it on the first take. I would say 85% of the movie, maybe 75, 85% of the movie was there. And then really the guts and, and the important stuff will come and I'll hone it in on, on, on the second draft and the third draft. Excellent. And, uh, and the, so once, once you had the script at a point where you were happy with it, is that when you went ahead and said, okay, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to, going to make this film. I, I was really I knew I was going to make it. I just needed to get the script right. And then I was sending, once that first version was there, I sent it to people to get people attached to it. Um, I sent it to my DP, my sound guy, just to get them attached to it and be like, this is what's next. You know what I mean? I I really like to think that I have a crew down pat that 
uh, will change over time, but it's like, uh, these are the people I want to work with. And these are the people that will work with me and, and we have a good rhythm and stuff like that. So yeah, I'll send it to all them. They'll be like, cool, let's do it. And then it just comes down to, all right, let's, let's get people casted and let's get people uh, going. And you, you had some, right. You had some ambition there. Like you, you got some, uh, Chicago legends in your cast. Yeah. So uh, the lead, I guess you could say lead play uh, junior plays by uh, a Chicago rapper named Shia. His name is Angel Pedraza. He's a, a pretty big Chicago rapper underground two thousands. Um, and o- like open for DMX, RIP DMX and stuff like that. And, and, and he's pretty big and known and he's never acted before, but I, I kind of felt, I think, artists in general this guy's been in 100 media music videos like they're not shy in front of a camera you know what i mean so i knew that i was able to hone it in it's it's just really about dialogue memorization and he knows all his raps right so it's like it's if i knew he was gonna put in the work and and so it's like all right i want to give him a shot i kind of wrote it for him with him in mind and when i sent it to him he's like i never acted before but like i want to do this and now he's actually uh, fully pursuing it. And he was just in Chicago fire the other day and uh, shout out to him. And he's putting a lot of work to try to get to where he wants to be. And did you know, had you met him before or? I knew, I knew him. He was, so I didn't, so he's technically my best friend's brother, but I never used that relationship to book him. I could have shot music videos when he was uh, on his apex. I could have, try to use that kind of relationship to in my advantage. But it, I didn't really, I was just kind of waiting for the right moment to be like, um, Hey, can I, can I approach your brother about something basically? And now it came 15 years after really uh, the relationship had started. So I, I tried not to take advantage of it, but it, it just became like we met each other because I go over her house and I go over uh, family functions and we kind of knew each other from there. And that, that's the when I kind of made my play, if you will. That makes sense. And I mean, look, you, you almost sound apologetic when you say it, <laughs> but like you inspired, you inspired this performer to like pursue, you know, to expand his artistic horizons. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, uh, you don't have to apologize for reaching out to, to uh, your best friend's brother and say, Hey, I think you'd be great in a film. And yeah, obviously you've been directing world, music yeah. videos. So you understand, you know, how performers are on camera. Yeah, and and he's knows lyrics, and he knows. Um, he, he, I would say he's a lyricist, right? He's what they would a classically call an MC, if you will. Not to get too uh, technical and stuff like that, but which, which I believe microphone controller, <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> Not E M C E E, was you know like like uh, uh, I'm forgetting Ed Ed uh, Ed Sullivan, not the yeah. Ed Sullivan MC, but yeah, no, yeah, yeah, more of a. a hip hop kind of um yeah. classic lyricist. So I, I knew I knew he had all the puzzles to make it fit. And I just knew if, if he just clicked in his brain that he wanted to do it, I think it would have never been a problem. And he read the script and, and liked it? Yeah. The first thing he told me was he grew up roughly in the same neighborhood I did. And the first thing he told me was I just like that you didn't do too much. Like the stuff that we grew up watching and, and witnessing doesn't need dramatization. It doesn't need to be exaggerated. It doesn't need to be fluffed up. Right. I told a story that we all probably knew growing up. And he just, the first thing he told me was, I just like that you didn't do too much. It's not to shoot him up. It's not too gangster. It's not to this, or that. It's just kind of like a little portrayal of, of a six hour night, you know, and, and, and he found it to be very, um, uh, just right up his alley. Yeah, I don't know if you'll remember better than I do, but I remember we uh, we changed the name of your screening because at Film Invasion we give every screening like a name, like something Spotlight. Didn't we go with Truth Spotlight? Yeah, yeah, I believe that's correct. Yeah. Truth, because like you, man, anyone you well, actually, you know what I screwed up on? I was should have asked you right off the top uh, where people is there somewhere people can catch Lupe today. Not so. Not right now. Only not because right now. um, there's a couple festivals that have been delayed this entire time. So you're right, right? I I submitted it. I submitted it to a bunch of different places right before COVID hit, and I think a, like you adjusted and zoomed it up, and I thought it was very appropriate, and I was very um, appreciative of just that experience. There are some festivals who just punted the ball and said, "We'll wait." 
And then a year turned into two years. And so there's just festivals where I'm still waiting on basically. And then I'm going to make a play to go online at some point. I, I, don't, I don't know what the next step is. There's one last step that I have to take. So uh, you actually can't watch it right now. So I apologize. Understood. Well, no, good. then I didn't drop the ball because yeah. we can't tell people that they should totally go to whether it's Voodoo or whatever. Yeah. Voodoo, Prime, iTunes, whatever. So they can't watch it yet. Right. But uh, – all that was because I was going to say, I think anyone who watches the film is just going to see just how true to life it is. And, and, and un, I mean, this is like a huge compliment on Hollywood. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it as a compliment. 100%. Yeah. Look, I don't, yeah. I don't believe in, I, I get it. Right. I get the sh- story structure i get the first act second act third act i totally get why that works and why people made billions of dollars on it like i totally get it but i think the 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 game is changing and we're seeing that with some of these little limited series some of these eight episode series that are one-offs some of these movies some of these tv shows that are just saying we just want to tell this super specific story that happens in this specific time and, and and place and it doesn't have to live anywhere but this place. Like it doesn't have to appeal to uh, China or Russia. It doesn't have to appeal to the globe, right? It's just like we we just want to tell this story and try to tell it as beautifully as we can. And I think um, I'm I was probably just a little bit onto that of just this idea of look, the more and more we just get real and authentic, I think people are going to uh, relate to it. I think authentic was a word I was looking for. Yeah, because I mean, look, we had a a recent. Uh, phenomenon happened, which was like that film Nomadland, which was just totally yeah. true to life for these nomadic Americans who go, you know, work their way around the country with the seasons, working jobs and then living off the grid. And, and it was just true to them and it was authentic to them. And it just clicked with audiences. Who would have guessed? No one yeah. would guess that that was no, no one sat around going, not only is it going to win and get nominated for Oscars and such, but it's it's going to really resonate with the average, you know, people at home watching Amazon Prime or watching Net- Netflix, right? But but uh, or was it Prime? I think it was. Netflix. I think it was Prime. Yeah, it was I could Prime. Be wrong. Yeah. No, Sound of Metal was Prime. I think that was. I don't might have been that. Hulu. I think it was Hulu. It I'm might have been that. Hulu. Yeah. No. But either way. In a way that I'm just comparing Lupe to that because, yeah, you, as true as that film was authentic to that life, yours is authentic to to that neighborhood you grew up in. Yeah, I appreciate that. That was my number one goal going in was, look, I grew up in a neighborhood where they would check you if it wasn't real enough. And I was dealing with people in the film who were, who would be like, no, this wouldn't happen. This is impossible. And I wouldn't say this. And I'll tell you a funny story. There's a, there's a scene. I don't know if you remember it. You should have, I should have sent it to you again and watch it prior to this, but um, there's a scene in the movie where someone, uh, two cars pull up and, and they meet to, with each other and someone opens the side door of the van to talk to this person. Do you remember this at all? Keep going. I think I do. It's basically just, it's in the beginning, two cars kind of meet up in this kind of alleyway. Instead of the windows going down or anything like that, there's the whole van side door opens up and they're talking. And my DP, who's who's white, was saying, why are we doing this? This is kind of weird that they would open the whole side door. And everybody else in the car laughed because everybody else in the car knew that they'd have done that or had that done to them before in the past. You know what I mean? So it's just as long, those little details that I know people in the film know people who grew up in those neighborhoods would know that stuff I think is where I like to live in because I know that when someone watches it, they're going to get it. And, and maybe not everybody gets it, but uh, it'll resonate with people. I think as long as you're just authentic to the culture and to, to the truth. And I think you've got, okay. So now, now here comes a question I wasn't expecting myself to ask, but, All right. but I think you've got a fascinating point of view in a way. Cause because so I learned tonight that that your family's from Jordan. Yeah. So you're growing up in a neighborhood. There couldn't have been that many other Jordanian kids around, right? All right. So you were part of this culture, but you were also an outsider to it, mm-hmm. which might make you a bit of an observer. So it's kind of it kind of make you know what I'm getting at already, right? That like like you you became an observer of of this and part of it, and that's what made you so ideally suited to tell a story about it. 
Yeah, like everybody likes to say identity crisis now because I think everybody knows that they have one at some point, right? But I grew up in a strict Middle Eastern household, but I grew up in a, in a predominantly black and Hispanic neighborhood. So there's two different worlds. And I, believe it or not, growing up, Jeff, I identified more with, with the Hispanic and kind of that black culture than I did with my own culture. It's like all my friends were black and Hispanic. All my things I were doing was in the neighborhood doing things and, and, and going to corner stores and playing softball till midnight and, and running from gangs or fighting with gang people. It was just like I was in this world and I would go home and I would expect to just turn all that off. And I was this, you know, this Middle Eastern kid who was eating Middle Eastern food in the middle of uh, a million different uh, uh, people that weren't like me, you know, and even though I never did dirt or I never got in trouble, I was just always with people who were doing that stuff. And so you're right. I was an observer. I'm a guest and I wholeheartedly understand that role. And I just like to think that I did tell a story that was authentic to me in the sense that I did observe this growing up. And, and when I, when you're in the, when people watch this film and they're in the car, people might, it's like everything that they teach you not to do. It's like, we got to get outside this car, get these people moving. Why are we in the car for 15 minutes before anything happens? And it's like, I want to put the camera there and you're a guest into this kind of world. And that's what I felt like was like, I was around this constantly. I was sometimes along for the ride that I didn't want to be. And and that's what I want to put the audience in that kind of, in, in that question of like, wait, if they're going to go do some bad shit, why am I in the car with them? I want to kind of leave here. And I, I want to force the audience to kind of be in that POV, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I was saying it makes, it makes perfect sense. It's great. All right. So I can't ask you about the reception to the film. Um, did you well, get I, the pleasure of having it in a theater with, uh, in did. Chicago with a nice yeah. crowd? Yeah. So uh, there's a theater in Chicago called the Music Box, which is like, I think the best theater in, in, in the city. It's like this old kind of, it's on an old, old street and it's old school and it's was around since the 1920s. And there's like ghost stories and there's like old dead employees that haunt it. It's like this whole kind of Chicago feel to it. You know what I mean? And I rented it out. This was right before, right before the pandemic hit. And I rented it out, uh, sold tickets, 350 people, ca- 350 people came out. Um, we had a Q and A and it was just like, one of the best nights of my life, probably the best professional night of my life, because I just, I put all this work together and um, to get to have my cast and crew come up there and, and have people ask them questions and applaud it. Everybody loved it from at least what they told me. Right. So uh, it was, it was, it was a great night and it, it was really well received because the majority of the audience was people who just grew up in those neighborhoods and they understood it. And for them to be like, yeah, like, I had somebody text me, Lupe was my cousin, like not physically. Right. But like, I know, I know her, you know, there's a, there's a line in the movie that's like, she's our mothers and she's our daughters. Like everybody was saying like, that's, I knew that person. It, it wasn't that specific person, but I knew a version of that person. So that was really important to me after the fact. For sure. And it's a community that I think we're well aware that there's a lot of appropriation uh, of black culture, of, of that of culture yeah black hispanic this that where it's presented in fact i just heard a really cool interview with uh machete um of uh, the actor uh uh i'm totally ruining your podcast now no, man, I, I, I know remember. who you're talking about you know what i'm talking about yeah. uh he's got restaurants and stuff around la now too uh keep talking i'll look at it uh, whatever no but but he said that uh you know he grew up in gangs and when edward james almost was making american me he was danny offered trejo. a hmm? danny trejo yeah yeah danny trejo why can i think of danny trejo's name and like like edward james like it was really inauthentic and the head of one of the biggest gangs in la he said to Danny Trejo, don't do that movie. Yeah. You know, cause, cause that's, that's bullshit. That move, that's, that story is bullshit. That's not how it happened. And it's not true to us. Yeah. You know, so, so I'm sure the community's dying for authenticity. Yeah. It's also a fine line, right? Like, I think there's a lot of people making 
uh, a lot of different things now that are very um, authentic and true, and they don't necessarily have to be crime ridden or drug ridden or negative, right? And I, I, there's a fine line. I, I wanted to tell this story because of, of what I mentioned earlier, this idea of what does happen to the missing girl and what what is a world that exists where that underworld kind of happens. I knew cops who had those relationships with different people like that. So people were like, cops would never get do that. And I'm just like, you really didn't understand how we grew up. Like you really truly didn't people cops had people's cell phone numbers, people called them. Like it was very, very regular, you know? So um, I I thought I I did a good, the way I like to look at it is there was people in the movie who would have checked me along the way. And it, we made this together as a team, and, and I'm very appreciative of them, of them and, and, and the work they put in for sure. Excellent. All right, so so you still got some festivals left. So you're 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 going to approach a uh, you're going to end up with a almost two year festival run, but yeah. of course a lot of it was interrupted by by a little thing that kept everyone inside for a year and a half and totally screwed up. The hard to believe there's still a movie industry actually. <laughs> yeah, for, they're, they they're, had, they're pushing hard. Yeah, they had that much cash sitting around that like Disney could lose like a couple hundred million a day and be like, "Well, we can do this for ten months. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll wait. We'll wait a little bit longer." Yeah. It's amazing. We'll keep the theme parks and the movie theaters. Everything's going to stay closed. But uh, but so, have you planned out what you're going to do next? Um, I, I want to start doing some um. Uh, I'm not planning a film. I'm writing my next film. It's a feature. We could talk about it after because I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah, you don't have to give but, anything away. Yeah, but I don't intend... I want to write this feature with the intention of not shooting it myself or not shooting it on a shoestring budget that I'm stringing together. So w- the reason I say that is because when you're writing something that you intend to shoot or that you intend to not have a budget for you limit yourself creatively because like you want explosions or you want this thing or you want this thing and you just limit yourself on the writing aspect because you can't fund it. So I want to just write something, a feature that could exist on its own. And then maybe I'll try to sell it or try to convince somebody to, to, to fund it and let me go do it um, with Lupe as my kind of showcase of like, if I made this with like no money, and I know it's not the greatest movie in the world, but if you just give me a little bit of money, give me some support, uh, I, we could do great things. So that's my next intention is kind of to write something that I, I could really push the bounds with creatively. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I, I clearly like Lupe didn't need to be any different from what it was. Right. But obviously when you sat down to write, you wrote within your means and you wrote mm-hmm. to a budget, which, yeah. you know, one could joke that you wrote to a zero budget, but yeah. but you wrote. So that it would be possible. Yeah. And yeah, you deserve a, you deserve the exercise of writing the impossible, right? Writing, writing whatever comes to your mind instead of what you think is practical. That, that's my intention. I want to, if I could psychologically psych myself out, I don't know if that's a word, but if I could just psych myself out, not to be like, don't limit yourself. You're not shooting this. Just focus on it. With, I do have the intention to get somebody to find this would, would be like um i'll say this like i want to i want to shoot that like the chicago goodfellas if you will so but in order to truly truly do that i have to be able to write with with no limitations so i'm really excited about that yeah i mean some stuff takes place in chicago but yeah it's chicago really never gets its respect from uh from all those uh, overrated Italian filmmakers who I, I'm already going to cause trouble if I, with that line. But, but yeah, it's just so New York based. Actually, one of my favorite films of all time, I think is, well, maybe it's not based in Chicago. I think it's based in Chicago, which, which is uh, Miller's Crossing. I think that's old school Chicago. Yeah. If yeah I'm not mistaken. It, it is old school Chicago. And it's like, yeah. it's, you know, cause it's made by a couple of mid- Midwestern dudes from yeah. Forgetting, I think they're from Wisconsin, but uh, I, but yeah. but anyhow, uh, well, since you don't want to give away too much on the next thing, but but people can look forward to it, and we can't can't tell people exactly where to go watch Lupe. Uh, That'll, I, I'll I'll set my plan is to put Lupe online. I, I don't know how, what, where, or why, but I'm just I want to cross my t's and dot my eyes, and then I think I'll I'll push it online. Uh, hopefully before the year is over, we'll see. 
Yeah. Yeah. And if, if you want to talk to some people who've, who've pushed stuff out there themselves and worked with, you know, the uh, aggregators and distributors, you know, I can put you in touch with people. I know a lot yeah, of filmmakers. I, I know a lot of filmmakers who have a lot of strong feelings about a lot of things. What can I say? Everyone's it's, it's, right. you know, it's the, it's the wild west now, right? Because it's a very interesting time to distribute digitally. Yeah. I think there's, there's spaces for, it's interesting, right? Cause everybody's so used to following a formula, right? It's like, we want a 15 minute short or we want the hour and a half movie or we want the series. Right. So I think there's a lot of space now with all of these different platforms just to have different, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason. There's no rules. And I think Lupe could find a home that, uh, that does it justice. So I'll definitely take you up on that offer. For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I will, uh, I will, I will talk us out of here with, with the outro, but before I do it, do you want to, is there a website or anything you want people to go check out that, that you uh, do or, or your social media? Well, probably for updates. Like you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Fadi from Chicago. So F-A-D-Y from Chicago, if you will. And, F-A-D-Y uh, from Chicago. And by the way, I found out before we started recording, you got your own podcast, Bruin. What's that called? People should search it out, right? Well, I'm trying to, st- I'm trying to do a political podcast. It's called the multitask where we kind of, do a combination of national and kind of local Chicago and politics is like as natural as it comes. Right. So there's, there's not a DC is obviously the hub, but Chicago can get pretty down and dirty. So yeah, it's, that's going to be kind of launching soon as well. We, we got a couple of episodes under our belt, but we're trying to really get deep before we kind of launch it. So yeah, that'll be coming hopefully soon enough as well. Very cool. All right. Well, people will look for that. Uh, wait, what was the title? I like that. It the was a good one. Yeah. The multitask. Yeah. I like that. The multitask. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, I will uh, talk us out of here so that when we can get to uh, your next, we're going to do two podcasts tonight. For those of you listening, uh, you should listen to the next podcast after this one on Discover Indie Film because the next one we're going to hear Jerry, I mean, Fadi answer the, the, uh, the Discovery Indie Film Four Questions includes his favorite film, so you'll learn what uh, what inspired him. So, anyhow, I mentioned at the top that Discovery Indie Film has a companion TV series, so you can learn about the TV series or the podcast if you go to discoverindiefilm.com. And if you want to check out the social media, it's at DIF Wins, because we were trying to decide what the handle would be, and DIF Wins was the winner, right? Um, and we had Lupe at Film Invasion Los Angeles, which is a film festival I'm very proud of. Um, it's been, uh, next year will be the seventh year, and you can learn about it. We held it every June in uh, Los Angeles. You can learn about it at filminvasionla.com and social media. It's at Film Invasion LA. And I actually have a second film festival that I'm the programmer of. That's the Sherman Oaks Film Festival. You can learn about it. And we have it every November. In fact, it's going to be eight days in a theater this November. I can't believe we've just been growing and growing. So I think 70 films in eight days. It's, uh, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to need to become, I'm going to need some uppers, man. I'm going to need some, some amphetamines to stay awake through that. But, uh, I, uh, you know, I got, I know a guy who works on sets. He's like anything you need, I can get on a set. But anyway, (laughs) not to joke about drugs too much, but, Sherman Oaks Film Festival is going to be this November. It's going to be wonderful. You can learn about it at ShermanOaksFF.com and on social media, it's at ShermanOaksFF. And uh, the last thing I got to do is grub for stars. Five stars. If you're listening to this podcast, that means you can give it five stars, I think, on Apple or iTunes or something. Or or if you watch the, you know what, the Discovery Indie Film TV series, go to Amazon or Amazon Prime Video. Give that five stars, you know, uh, the world uh, giving someone five stars is an act of kindness and can't be too much kindness in the world we need more of it right all right well thank you Fadi for for a good talk and uh, I'll stop recording and then we'll start recording again thanks for having me on Jeff I appreciate it all right and thank you everyone who listened